for me, you know, working at Panzura and being in the storage industry for a long time, this is just a lot of fun. So I enjoy everything I do, and uh, I certainly enjoy talking about uh, our particular solution and, more importantly, how it plays in this space. I, I've I've been in the industry a long time, and I've never seen a solution that is uh, this compelling or, or has this much of an effect on anything. So um, with that, let's get moving and figure out what this is all about. So. Uh, the first thing to think about is, you know, what what is it that Panzura does? Um, plain and simple, we're a storage company. Okay, what does that mean? Um, uh, end users utilize us and use us uh, as as they would any other NAS device. A typical NAS device in your environment uh, would come in the form of a Windows file server that you would access via uh, your traditional Windows Explorer. Um, no, no special tools required. Panzura is going to look much like that. And in fact, what this slide is, is trying to show you in a fairly technical way, I'll be honest, is, is what are the different types of storage, right? On the far left, you have your SAN storage. This is something you, know, you might have in your environment. Uh, you might mount that via uh, a Windows file server and present that to your end users in the form of a file system, files and folders. On the other hand, in the middle, you have your traditional NAS, and this is a device that 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 doesn't require, you know, a Windows file server to mount it. Um, it just presents a file system naturally. It's it's inherently what it does. Okay, and on the but in both of those cases, the disks, the actual media, tends to be local to the device itself, and and by the same token, users that are local to that that entire stack get a good experience. Okay. The converse is, is, is that users that are far away from that stack don't necessarily get a very high quality experience. And in fact, the further away you are, the worse your experience gets. And so there's a lot of solutions out there that try to mitigate this, but um, in, in the AEC uh, industry specifically, that becomes very challenging. It leads to long events. Enter Panzura. Right? We're on the extreme right-hand side. Again, we look like a NAS device, network attached storage. That means we're going to present a file system. It's friendly uh, in the form of files and folders to end users. That's what end users see when they access us. Um, on the other hand, the unique part about Panzura is that we don't have to be adjacent to the media, to the disks. Our machines can be very, very far away from the disks. For example, uh, we have customers with disks in Australia and users in North America. It's about as far away as you can get, and we're able to sustain that type of uh, situation. Uh, so extremely far away. Um, and as you'll see, we offer some other benefits as well, this whole globalization of that data. We'll talk about what that means uh, as we move forward here. So moving forward, um, you know, the thing that I've realized as we've gotten into this industry is there's a lot of companies out there that are narrowly focused and birthed, if you will, to, to focus specifically on the AEC or the AECO industry. Um, Panzer is not one of those companies. We were actually focused in, you know, and born as a storage company. And to that end, we have lots of customers in many different types of industries. If you look here, we've got everything from oil and gas to entertainment to legal firms to government um, to even a few grocery stores in there, right? It's very diverse. Now, if you start to focus on the upper right-hand corner, that's more of our AEC, our engineering, our architects, our construction firms are up in that right-hand corner. <clears throat> and uh, the beauty of that is that um, while there's a lot of solutions very narrowly focused at one application or one particular workflow, uh, our goal is, yes, we can, we can certainly address applications and workflows uh, that, are, that are causing you a problem and consternation in your, in your particular environment, but we can also address many other workflows as well, and we've got a lot of experience doing that in, in other very critical uh, situations. And in fact, let's talk about two here. These are very, very different situations. On the one hand, on the left side, you have the U.S. Department of Justice, Attorney General's Office. Effectively, this is the world's largest law firm. It's every single Attorney General's Office in the United States and the territories, 265 some odd sites. Um, prior to Panzura, they had you know, storage devices, little Windows servers in every single office. It created them a lot of challenges. It created them a challenge of how do we share data from one office to the next? How do we protect this data, right? How do we back this data up? 
what happens when we run out of space. And this is important stuff. If you think about it, this is stuff that puts people in jail or keeps them out of jail. It's data that has to live on really forever. Okay? And prior to Panzura, they were, they were struggling with how to maintain those offices. With Panzura, they deployed us at their remote, their remote offices. They, they now never run out of storage, and we offer them uh, continuous backup, continuous protection of that data centrally out on the East Coast in one of their data centers, or actually, actually it's a pair of their data centers. And um, uh, we also allow them to collaborate um, from one office to the next and really share that data effectively between offices. Um, uh, the, the other key things there, and one of the reasons why you know, I like that particular case study is, you think about it, U.S. Department of Justice, security is paramount. Protecting that data, making it for eyes only is very important. We've been tested, you know, they, they sent us through the rigors on that, and we passed with flying colors. We're the single source vendor for that, and we have the FIPS 140-2 uh, certification to prove it. It's very unique in this industry. Um, on the flip side, we have a traditional engineering company, CNS. Okay, these guys had centralized storage. We'll talk about their use case in a little bit here going forward too. Um, they had centralized their storage uh, in their main location in New York. That was great if you were in New York. It was a little challenging if you were far away from New York. And they had done all the traditional steps, upgraded bandwidth, deployed riverbeds, um, done other things, talked to people about how to adjust their workflows. The challenge here is they still had clicks that were 10, 15, 20 plus minutes long. And these clicks could be opening projects, they could be saving projects, they could be doing things like a sync with central in the Revit space um, in, in order to allow work sharing. Very, very painful operations, you know. And uh, so what they did is they deployed Panzuras. They also leveraged in their model uh, traditional cloud storage, public cloud storage. They use Amazon. Okay, and so we were able to do two things there for them. Uh, we were able to allow them to collaborate office to office. We were able to allow them to centralize their data. Um, we were able to uh, collapse their data. And what you'll see is that, you know, uh, instead of forcing them to, to upgrade it to a new SAN that would have cost them a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, depending on how much of it they implemented, what they do now is they deposit their data in Amazon. They pay five to seven hundred dollars a month for that. Fully redundant, fully backed up, fully archived. But at the same time, uh, you know, you think about, hey, I moved my data further away. I moved it out of my organization. Um, it got faster. Okay. And it didn't just get faster in one location. It got faster in all locations. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about how we do that. So uh, some solution goals here. <clears throat> Very high level goals for the AEC industry specifically. Um, when we started peeling back the onion and looking at it, these were the goals, right? We want to centralize storage, right? If you think about it, the data that the various engineers and architects and others in your organizations are creating is the heart and soul of your organization. That is what you're creating. So if we can centralize that, we can protect it. Administrators can get their arms around it, make sure solid policies and durability uh, properties are applied to that storage so that it's going to be there even if something bad happens, you know, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, whatever it might be, it's going to be there, okay? Um, but at the same time, we have a distributed user environment, and we don't want a particular user who is far away to pay the price for being far away. Maybe he's the expert in his field. Maybe he's the only guy in the world that can design a certain part. And it's important that you have him on board at your company and we don't want to, to slow him down in any way, shape, or form because he's the expert, right? And so it's important to do both centralization and distribution at the same time. And those seem a little mutually exclusive, and a lot of times they are, but Panzura has brought them together. And finally, we want to maintain existing workflows, right? I don't want, and we certainly don't have a solution where, you know, hey, we've addressed all these things, but I've got to send you to a two-week training course, and then I've got to send all your people to that same two-week training course to figure it out. That is absolutely not the case. And in fact, uh, if you talk to CNS and our other customers, uh, they implemented it over a weekend, didn't tell anybody. The people came in on Monday and just started working. Um, in fact, they started working a lot better. So very, very simple, uh, and we maintain that existing workflow. And that's important uh, to realize uh, our client-side interface, how clients interact with us and users interact with us, is just the same as interacting with a Windows server, which they already use today. So let's talk about it. You know, lots of people have lots of different reasons why 
certain things might go slow. It might be bandwidth. It might be the size of the files. It might be my workstation. Okay. At the end of the day, this is so prevalent. It actually has a name called the file open problem. Okay. And again, in, in the Civil 3D and AutoCAD based products, it, uh, it, it tends to be on, on the open side. On the Revit and other based products, it might, might appear more on the save side or the sync with central side. But either way, there's this long operation. And, and the problem here is time. It's the one thing that money can't buy. Time is going to pass. And so if we can minimize the use of time in certain things, we win. And, and, and effectively, we'll win back productivity. And so what we found is, well, most people look at it as a data movement problem. Yeah, I've got to move this file from one place to the next. What we've actually seen is it's a latency problem. It's the distance you have to cover. And in fact, it's not only latency, it's, it's the amount of conversation or the chattiness, if you will, of the application when it's actually trying to open. What are the other things it needs to verify? Does it need to check custom templates and fonts and what the other people on the project have done? How many of those things does it have to check? How many times does it have to go back and forth to do those checks? That's latency. So bandwidth affects the width of the road. Latency is the length of the road. Right? And so what we're trying to do here is eliminate that length of road. And, um, and that's where bandwidth optimization, like Riverbed or, or some of these other products, don't necessarily address that. They address the moving of the data, but not the chattiness. We'll talk about that a little bit here in our next example. So here's an example. Okay, we purposely chose an extremely f small file. It's actually a template file. Um, it's very small, it's 1.5 megabytes. The point of this is that, hey, look at, on my 1984 cell phone, I could move a 1.5 megabyte file in, what, a minute? Something very, very small. But that's not what was happening here. Okay, so uh, this is at, an actual example at CNS, centralized storage, it's in New York. Uh, you have a user in San Diego, okay? The distance between San Diego and New York is, is fairly great. And in this case, that accounted for 86 milliseconds of round, of round trip time. Now, you might think, hey, 86 milliseconds, not that big a deal if I do it once. And you would be right. But what you'll see is it happened a whole lot more than once. So like most customers, they upgraded their bandwidth. They added some WAN acceleration. They made that bandwidth hotter. And I don't know if you can see that transition, but the lines got red. But what you don't see is those lines didn't shrink. The round trip time is still 86 milliseconds. So let me show you how that gets affected. What we noticed when we looked at this project, again, very, very small project, is in order to open this template file, there was many, many checks. In fact, in this case, uh, the file opens and locks that the application was doing to verify that template and all of its dependencies happened to account for over 4,500 round trips across that network, across that latency. Okay, and in this case, if you do some very, very simple math and you multiply 4,500 times 86 milliseconds, you're up at approximately six and a half minutes. Okay, now let's think about it. If you're going to do opens and locks, you're going to do approximately the same amount of closes and unlocks. And prior to that, you had to do about the same number of lookups. So if you add all those up, you're up around 18 to 20 minutes. And you haven't moved any data, you've just checked. This is the chatter, if you will of opening a project. It's all the verifications. And these are things that, that late that, uh, bandwidth and WAN acceleration cannot address. You cannot cache the fact that somebody deleted a file or that somebody added a file, or somebody changed the file. You can cache the file, but not the, the fact that it did change. Okay, so at the end of the day, hey, yeah, I've finished all those checks and now I actually need to move the 1.5 megabytes. Great, that's a thousand packets. It's really no big deal. If you do the math on that, that 7% of the network traffic was actual data. The 93% in this case was chatter. Okay, and if you do some simple math and add that all up, that comes up to 22 minutes. And that's exactly what the end user was seeing, waiting for that simple template to open uh, in San Diego as they were pulling it in from their, from their New York headquarters. Very, very painful. So let's look at the same situation with Panzura. Same project. Centralized storage, but in this case, we've got a Panzera device, one of our uh, little servers. And this is a one, typically a 1U or a 2U box. And when I say a U, that stands for rack unit. Um, oftentimes, a 1U is considered a pizza box. That's approximately the shape of it. Um, and in this case, because it's deployed locally, you now get local latency, down the hall type latency. And in this case, 
it's half of a millisecond. Notice it starts with a zero this time. It's approximately 150 times faster. Okay, so we didn't change anything. In this case, civil, it's, it's a civil 3D example. In this case, civil is going to do the exact same thing. The 4500 uh, opens and locks. And approximately the same number of closes, lookups, and unlocks. Okay, and if you're doing some math here, you know, uh, 15,000 times half of a millisecond is very, very short. We're at six or seven seconds at this point in time. And finally, moving the data, hey, we're going to do all the right things on moving that data as well. It's going to be compressed. It's going to be deduplicated, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, too. We're going to use that network efficiently. When Megan was introducing us, the legacy of our company is, is, a, is a collection of very, very strong and seasoned network engineers. We're leveraging that history as well here to move this data. Now, if you're doing the math here and adding this all up, this is eight seconds. We just changed 22 minutes into eight seconds. And we'll tell you exactly how we do it in addition to just deploying a device there. But beyond this, you get some benefits, right? Because you can't just create data. You've got to protect the data. Typically, you're backing it up. You're doing some other things. Um, you have some tapes, or you have a person out there that on a nightly basis kicks off a process. Hey, we're doing that automatically as those changes are coming in, not at the end of the night, not at the end of the week, as the changes are coming in, we're sending them to that centralized location to make sure they get protected there. Again, we're also optimizing the bandwidth. I already talked about that a bit. But the final benefit, and there is just one more thing here, is I have the ability to not just do that at one site. I have the ability to do that at n sites all at the same time. And in this case, I've, I've shown five sites here. Remember, our biggest example uh, so far that I've given is the US Department of Justice over 260 sites right and so the benefit is this is where we have what we call a global file system okay I don't just present files and folders at one location I have the ability to present those same files those same folders those same permissions the same consistent locks at as many locations as you want and every location can get that same level of performance in this case the eight seconds Let's look at how that proved out. Here's a table, some numbers. You know, it's maybe a little challenging to digest. Let me walk you through it briefly. Um, the third, I'm sorry, the second column there labeled CA to NY, that's the example I just gave you. Again, it starts at the top with 1.5 megabyte file. It's got the 86 millisecond round trip time. They've got some WAN bandwidth. In this case, it was 10 megabits. Um, the time to open directly, this is no, no WAN acceleration here, was 22 minutes. With WAN acceleration, you know, most people know, hey, your first hit might be a little slower. In this case, it was 24 minutes. And then once the cache is populated on a WAN accelerator, it gets a little faster. In this case, it got to 20 minutes. So yes, WAN acceleration helped a little bit, but I would argue 20 minutes for a click is still a very, very long time. In our case with Panzura, it was eight seconds. Okay, Compare that to New York. I mean, I'm sorry, Arizona to New York, the final column here. It's the same file, 1.5 megabytes. They've got a different latency. It's, it's less this time, 66 milliseconds, but, and they also have less bandwidth. And if you look at it, you can already see where that latency starts to affect it. The time is less. Even though they have less bandwidth, the time is less. That's because the latency, the most important number here, was also less. It's 16 minutes. When accelerated, you got up to 15 minutes, or down to 15 minutes, if you will. Still, a really long time. I could get a cup of coffee, wait for it to cool down, and drink it in that amount of time. Okay, with Panzura, eight seconds. Okay, and I've had people say, well, hey, yeah, I can move 1.5 megabytes. Sure, if I had a zip file, single zip file, that that's all I was doing and had no dependencies, yeah, I could move that in about two seconds over a six megabit link. So it's not about the bandwidth, it's about something else, and it's about all those verifications that the applications do. So that was Civil 3D. The other big product uh, that we often talk about is Revit, and there's many more. This is a, a webinar, so we don't have time to address them all, but uh, Civil and Revit tend to be the most popular, and they, they both represent themselves in, in, in uh, the two major ways that we see. So in this case, you have Revit, again, centralized storage. In this case, it was a, a larger file, 170 megabyte, which is a respectable Revit file size. This happened to be an airport they were working on. Um, Revit work sharing was enabled. The other team, there was two teams working on it, one team in Florida, one team in New York. Um, the New York team was local to the data. The, the Florida team was remote to the data. It was 60 seconds, I'm sorry, 60 millisecond latency. Um, those remote folks, 15 to 20 minutes 
sync with centrals. Okay, that's very challenging because um, you want that information coming in. You want that information to be saved often. I think that's obvious, the benefits there. The, the maybe less obvious benefit is by, by doing a sync with central more often, the other people working in that project get the updates. Now you know if somebody put a beam through the middle of the room that shouldn't have a beam in it. You know that right away, the more often you sync with central. Um, the other challenge that they had is not only was the sync with centrals long, but sometimes they just simply didn't complete. Okay, very, very, very frustrating, especially when you're trying to close out a project, waiting to submit it maybe the next day or within the end of the week or something like that. Um, also, what they noticed is exponential decay. The more users that were added to the Revit project, the worse things got. Okay, and so they would tend to keep their users to five, maybe eight users on a project, no more, because it bec would become unusable. So, uh, side effects. People were saving locally. Okay, I'm just going to save locally. At least it's saved. But the problem is now when I do do that sync with central, at whatever time I pay the piper on that and do that long click, I have more conflicts to resolve. It's just very confusing. Um, I end up with multiple different IT organizations. because Now you really have to have an IT organization supporting those remote people and in there making sure their desktops are good, as well as somebody supporting the central storage. And ultimately, you know, your BIM uh, manager or, or whoever is responsible for the project, it's a pretty big headache for him. There's various different ways I see people resolving this, sometimes with FTP, sometimes via email. And um, it's got to be a pretty rough job for somebody to figure out how to integrate all those changes. So let's look at it with Panzura. First thing you should notice is hopefully it's a lot less complicated drawing. Still centralized storage. We, in this case, we still put it in the Amazon cloud. It can really go anywhere. I'm, uh, a cloud is just storage that I access via an IP address. It could be public or private. This does happen to be public. Um, in this case, there are those little Panzura devices deployed at the remote locations. The benefit here is that everything these end users are doing at those remote locations, they're doing to that local device. And this is a well-built device. It's got a great complement of, of CPU and RAM and SSDs on board. It's very, very poppy, very, very explosive type performance. Um, so you're always reading and writing at that level. What that did is it took those sync with centrals from very long to sometimes infinite to eight seconds. Okay, again, that magic eight second number. And really what we look at that eight second number is, is that's just the amount of time it takes to blast data over a LAN. I mean, that's, that's about all we can do. I would argue compared to 15 minutes, it's zero, but it was still a measurable amount. Um, and in fact, at CNS, they have a, they have a Revit expert. A gentleman by the name of Eric Wing, W-I-N-G. Um, and if you look him up on uh, Amazon or Google, you'll find that he's written a collection, a large collection of Revit books, really really how to use them. And a lot of people look to him on, on, on how to do that. And so I, I wanted to talk to Eric to figure out, hey, Eric, you know, what's your experience there? And I asked him, um, Eric, can you qualify it? You were a local guy before. How was your experience? And, and his quote is there. Revit with Panzura is crazy fast. You know, I asked him, is that your technical definition? He said, yeah, I'm sticking with that. So, uh, you know, we put it in the slide deck. I always love that quote. But uh, here you have an expert who was previously local to his data, and he said, yeah, we deployed this Panzura, and it got faster, even for him being a local person. That's an amazing opportunity. Um, they were also able to add more users to the project, complete them quicker, eliminate flights from Florida to New York. That was the other solution they used. Hey, at the end of the project, last week or two, let's fly everybody up, powwow in one room, spend a lot of money on hotel rooms and all that stuff, and uh, really blast the project out. They don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. So here's the same kind of chart example, uh, same kind of data. Uh, average size Revit file, 170 megabytes. Uh, 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 you know, really not that much latency. 60 millisecond is not a lot of latency. It's just Florida to New York. It's not even international. Um, WAN bandwidth was acceptable, 8 megabits. You know, it's a decent amount of bandwidth. Um, but hey, it was taking 15, 16, 17, 18 minutes, sometimes never, to do the sync with Central. Again, a very important operation. With Panzura, 8 seconds. With Panzura, with a whole lot of users, 50 users in this case, still 8 seconds. Right? We maintain that consistent level of performance and consistently good. Okay. Finally, there's another thing that's you know, a whole lot less obvious. And you look at, well, how are you moving data? You know, one strategy today that a lot of our customers employ is, hey, you know what, I'm just going to 
copy my data with a kind of robocopy or some other mechanism nightly. I'll copy it from all my locations. You know, one challenge there is you actually have separate locations of the data. You don't have a single collective project. You actually have n projects in that model. But let, let's put that aside for a little bit. Let's look at just moving that data. In this example, if I'm creating data in New York and I want to distribute that data worldwide to five other faraway locations, I've got to move that data out of New York utilizing New York's probably already overutilized bandwidth. I've got to use that network five times to move those files every single time. It's effectively in serial to each of those locations. In the Panzura model, it's different. Okay, everything we do, we're going to send it to that centralized storage. So in this case, we send the file once from New York to that centralized location. We use New York's bandwidth one time. Okay, from that centralized location, in this example, five other locations can pull that data in. And here, they can actually pull it in using their download bandwidth performance. And this is, in this case, public internet bandwidth. It's, it's, in this case, it was uh, asymmetrical. Download was faster than upload. It's typically a cheaper way to do that. We're allowing them to leverage that higher performance download link off their public internet connection, their cheaper internet connection, to do this. In this example, that results in a 25 times improvement in speed. And that 25 times would go up the more locations you have. Right? So the more people that need the data, the better this model is going to get. So let's talk about how we do this. Right? I know my experience in this industry is that there's a lot of people saying, hey, I've solved one problem or, or another, and, and the solution is very narrowly focused on something. And uh, you know, they don't always, quite honestly, they don't always fully deliver. So let's talk about what we do, because we do fully deliver. So let's look at the secret sauce here. So in this example, we've got three locations. We've got New York on the left. We've got London on the right. And we've got Paris down, down at the bottom there. And um, each location has users. And users like file systems, right? This is how we think, right? You create files and folders. You may create some sub-files and folders. And then ultimately, you have data actually living there in, in one of those files or folders. In addition to that, you have permissions, making sure that the right eyes can see, the, can see and manipulate the right files and, and not the wrong way around. You have all those things. And in this example, I don't know if you can see it on your screen or not, but each location not only has that file system, but it's exactly the same. Okay? And that's what a global file system means, at least in Panzura terms, that uh, no matter where you are, again, you see the same files, the same folders, the same permissions, and what we'll also talk about is the same locks. Okay. And so let's look at it. Let's assume a New York user creates a file. OK, well, it's a little bit technical here. But if you think about it, what actually happens, what a file system actually does, it creates two things. It creates the file, the bits, the drawing, if you will. But it also creates a little extra piece of data called the metadata. And this is really the data about the data, or the soul, if you will, of the file system. It contains the file name or the folder name, the permissions. It contains the date stamps. It contains who did the changes last and when it was created, all these things. It also contains, we also add some extra information, like the deduplication fingerprints to it. Okay? And, all, and all NAS devices are going to do this. Okay? Now, where Panzura tends to be a little bit unique here is that we have the ability to fully manage the, meta and data, the metadata and data separately. Okay? And let me show you how that works. So let's say, hey, we create this metadata. I'm going to push it up to my centralized storage. And again, this is small. This is bits. Bits of data just got to the centralized storage, much, much smaller than the actual drawing itself. And I don't know if you saw it because it, it went pretty fast, but that metadata then gets pulled into the New York and the London location. And this is what our remote machines are doing aggressively. They're looking for metadata updates, and they're aggressively sucking that in. What that does at this point in time for London and New York I'm sorry, for London and Paris is that they now have full knowledge of that change made in New York. And they only move bits. We didn't have to move that file. It could be a 1 meg file. It can be a 500 meg file. We didn't have to move the actual data yet for them to see the knowledge of it. Okay. Now, at a certain point in time, we actually move the data itself. It gets to the centralized storage. And it might take you know, varying amounts of time based on the amount of bandwidth you have. We can't defy physics there. We are, again, doing smart things. We're squashing it down with compression. We're eliminating redundant blocks with deduplication. But we do actually have to move it to the centralized storage. 
the benefit here is now let's assume a user in London actually goes to open one of his projects. And this new file that I've just created in New York is, is a dependency of one of his projects. So what his project does when it goes out and does those 4,500 some odd checks is it just says, hey, when was the last time this file was changed? And when was the last time the other 2,000 files that I'm linked to changed? It's just looking at the date stamps. It's just interrogating metadata. And again, I've aggressively moved that metadata. I've moved those critical bits to that edge location. So the bulk of those checks, we're able to resolve them. We're able to say, yeah, hey, nothing changed, nothing changed, nothing changed. Oh, hey, something did change that you care about. Guess what? At this point in time, we'll move that data in because you're specifically asking for it. But the big difference here compared to you know, your nightly robocopy or your full sync job is I only moved the pointed data that you needed. I didn't move all the other data that you were just uninterested in. I didn't do that. Only the pointed stuff that you're interested in. And you know, I mentioned it briefly before. One of the things that we keep in the metadata is the deduplication fingerprints. And because we have the, the metadata at all locations, I therefore have all of the deduplication fingerprints at all the locations. So now what I'm able to do is employ a global dedupe. Okay, so any part of your data that has previously been ingested or used at a location, I never have to move again. Okay, so it's very, very efficient on the data movement. Panzero is the only company that does global dedupe. The other, the other question I often get on this slide is, hey, that's great. We have this global file system. Everybody can kind of see the same thing at the same time. What if there's a user in New York? And what if there's a user in London who try to do the same thing at the same time? Wouldn't they step on each other? And in a lot of solutions that try to implement a global file system, yeah, they would step on each other, right? And some poor guy's job at the end of the day is to synchronize that up. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that job. In our model, we have a concept, and I'm, I, I don't have the time to explain it fully here, but we have the concept of, of, of global locking. And this is consistent global locking. There's no 60 second window or 30 second window or 15 second window of, yeah, maybe if people do the same thing at the same time within this window, there might be a little conflict. There's no window. There's no opportunity for conflict on either side. What would happen is if two people try to do the same thing at the same time, one of them is going to be allowed to do it. They're going to get the ability to read and write. The other is going to get that message that says, hey, user so-and-so already has this file in use. You get the option to open it read only. You can open a copy of it, or you can cancel. It's the same Windows dialog that they get today. And at the end of the day, this is a complicated drawing, right? We've got multiple locations and machines and networks and, and circles and arrows and clouds and storage. We've got all this complicated stuff on this picture. At the end of the day, what does this behave like for an end user? It behaves like a single Windows server in the center. That is the metaphor that they're using. And so the behavior that a user would get with a single Windows server from a locking and, a, and a allowing one user to do things at the same time as another user, that's the same behavior they're going to get with us with the added benefit that that Windows server is always close to them. They always have that local performance regardless of their location. So, you know, again, we've been around for a while. Um, we have machines that play in all kinds of different spaces, but for this space, we want to have machines that are very, very focused on this space. We want to be able to address that big corporate location with 10,000 users. And we also want to address the construction trailer with three users. And so we created a specific product line for this, for this industry. We've got additional products as well. These are just the most popular ones that we sell in this space. Uh, generally, we size them based on user count and the location. We try to make it extremely easy to uh, deploy and purchase. And in fact, um, when I used to do a lot of deployments, I, I've been at Panzer of four years now. When I used to do a lot of deployments, I would keep it interesting for myself and I would time it. I'd time myself from cardboard box to ingesting data. And I could light up a, a petabyte sized file system, which is a giant file system. I could light that up uh, from cardboard to running about 25 minutes, right? So they're very, very easy to deploy. Um, management is very seamless. You know, we've got a great support organization as well to to assist there with its, with some very powerful capabilities. But um, the box are simple, and now we've made deploying and sizing them also simple. So finally, in summary, and this is really my last slide here, um, the goal is again centralized storage, right? I think I've touched on that. You saw the picture; it was kind of a hub and spoke drawing. 
everything goes in and out of that centralized storage. Everything is there, right? The metadata, the data, all other information is there. And that's one of the benefits, too, that our customers reap. Um, you know, hey, at one of those locations, let's assume something bad happened in uh, San Diego. We've had a couple earthquakes recently here in California. Let's assume San Diego falls off into the ocean, okay? And our, and our machine goes into the ocean with it. Data's fine. We'll deploy another machine in whatever uh, location that office lights back up in. Your data's gonna come back. It was at that centralized storage. My machine at the edge gives you a window into the data. It, it is not critically storing the data from a, from a business standpoint. Okay, so that's the benefit of centralized storage. Uh, distributed end user experience. Again, you think centralized storage, you think centralized and distributed at the same time, they seem kind of mutually exclusive. In our model, they're not. That's really the magic of Panzura. Right? We've really eliminated that file open problem. We've really enhanced and made very, very fast Revit work sharing, and especially globally. Uh, remember, bandwidth isn't the problem. Right? I can move that 1.5 megabyte file in about two seconds with a six megabit link. Yet for some reason, it was still taking 15 to 25 minutes. That's because latency is the problem. Panzero addresses latency. Again, we look like a standard Windows server. That's the end user interface. That also means that's what applications see. And so we've, while well, today I've talked mostly about Civil 3D and Revit, any other application you have, MicroStation, you know, the various other engineering applications, they all work with us. In addition to that, hey, Microsoft Office, Word, PowerPoint, your PDFs, your family pictures from your reunion last weekend, they can all live on our device. They all get the same benefit, right? Because we look like a standard Windows file system. And again, the benefit there of being standards-based is your traditional tools on your desktops today, they work with us without any changes. I don't have to install anything. I don't have to train anybody. I don't have to change any workflows. They just go, and they go faster. 